Okay, so now just picking up where we left off before, um, if you were given an electronic exam, not a test on paper where a teacher stands over you and watches that you're not cheating, but you're sitting at home taking a test electronically, um, and the question is, is there ways for cheating on that and what kind of data science uh, could be available uh, for that? So, um, I did speak the last day of our class, the last day of our lecture. I gave an example where we had, uh, let's say we had five students in a class, student A, B, C, F1, and F2. And suppose um, the student, uh, one, student A got a 93 average and deserves an A. Student uh, B has an 85 average and deserves a B. Student C has a 77 average and deserves a C. Student uh, F1 has a 99 average but cheated on the test and deserves an F. And student F2 got a 96 and deserves an F because they cheated. So I went over this on the last, the last class. You could look over that if you want. So what would have to happen here? Well, first of all, if the, if the student was caught cheating, uh, if the student was not caught cheating, then the teacher would have to give these two students an A. But now the problem is, because we can't give everybody A's, Right? We have to curve the classes up and down because it doesn't make sense statistically that one semester you have a whole bunch of really, really smart students and the previous semester and the semester after you don't. So it must have been that the tests were so easy that these students deserve a lower grade. So that the student who deserves an A gets a B and the student who deserves a B gets a C and the student who deserves a C gets an F because these two students cheated and got an A. Right? So, um, so I went over the, all the reasons why a uh, university would want the courses to be curved up and down. Uh, might, some people might say, just give these, give it all the ones who cheated an A and then give everyone else what they deserve. There's logical reasons why that can't be done. So, so, uh, so there's two kinds of cheating. One is where you cheat prior to a test. So the idea is if a professor gives the same tests over and over, same questions over and over from semester to semester, um, and the students, with the internet now and emails, it's very easy to do. You just keep passing the tests with the old graded tests around so you know all the answers to all the tests. You can, um, the students can have a big bank of questions. And when they take the question, they read the question, they look at the answer key, and they say there's the answer, and they copy the answer. Right, so that would be where the professor is giving the same questions over and over. Now, I spoke on the last test, uh, the last, uh, our last class, why professors have to do this. If your program is being accredited, the accreditation uh, companies want to make sure you keep giving the same programs and the same assignments so they can see how you've changed your teaching method and the students got better at it. If you change your questions or change the programs, then you can't prove your program's getting better. So they're required to give some tests and some projects have to be exactly the same from semester to semester. Um, the other thing is you kind of want to do that anyway because if you keep changing all the tests, you could one semester have a very hard course and another semester have a very easy course and that's not fair to the students. So what students can do is take the old projects and the old tests from previous semesters. They know what the answers are because the professor gave the answers back and then they make a big question bank, and then when they take their test, they just fill out the answers, because they already have the answers. So that's cheating before the test. And then, uh, so a solution to this, cheating prior to the test, this professor can give many, many tests. And uh, some of the tests contain the same questions from previous semesters. And some of the tests contain brand new, never seen before questions. So that way the professor can not only check from semester to semester if the students are learning the material better, but some of the questions will be pre on previous exams and some will be brand new. So if a student does extremely well on a test where they have the answers from a previous semester but do horribly bad when on the test where the exams are brand new, never appeared anywhere in questions, then it would be obvious that that student was cheating. But again, you have to statistically give enough 
uh, tests <laughs> to make sure that this happens. So, um, so basically, now on a true or false test, the amount of knowledge you had, we said, was grade minus 50 times 2. So just a, as a quick example, I went over this in our last class. If you know 100% of what's going on, your grade would probably be 100, and you'd get an A+. Plus. If you know 90% of what's going on, you would get a 95 on the test, your expected value, because 90% of the questions, you would know what you're doing, and you'd get them perfectly correct. 10% of the questions, you don't know, so you take a guess, and you're going to get them right half the time. So a grade of 95 means you know 90% of the material. A grade of 92 means you know 84% of the material and so on. We work your way down the chart. The lowest is where you know nothing, you'll still get a 50 on the test, even though you don't know anything. So that's kind of expected. So, so this is uh, grades from uh, an operating systems class. I don't have students' names or anything like that. But, um, so the way the grades were done, these were, 20, these were tests that had 24 true or false questions, right? right? That's what a lot of tests were. Were there any of them different? No, it's mostly true or false. Right, and there were 24 questions? Yeah, six, yeah, uh, 24. 24. Yeah, 24. Right, six questions, but each had four. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So okay, so the 24 true or false questions, each question was worth four points, and then everyone got four free points. Right? So, so this student got a four on every test. So this was a student who dropped the class. So, so everyone gets four free points. That's why he, he kept getting a four, even though he never took the test. All right, so every question is basically worth four points. So a student like this, this student got a hundred on the first test, every question right, a 96 on the next test. So that means they got 23 out of 24 questions right. A 92 means 22 out of 24 questions, right? And then a 56 on this test, right? Now, if you get four free points, um, if you get 13 out of 24, right, you would get a 56. 13 out of 24, right? Then got a 96 on this test, which means they got 23 out of 24, right? That's a very good grade. And then a 60 on this test, which means they got uh, 10 wrong. So they got 14 right and 10 wrong out of 24 questions. Then what we did on our final exam is we had two tests, right? We had test one and test two. So it's final exam part one and final exam part two. And uh, so, the, so you took a one-hour test, and then we had a 10-minute break, and then another one-hour test. So this student got 100 on the first test, first part of the final, final part one, and a 60 on final part two. Okay, so what would you say is the reason? Why do you think the student kept, did great, 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 horrible, great, horrible, great, horrible? What was it? Like, did they have a bad day, or they... They didn't know these topics. Um, yeah, for one test it was like uh, when we were trying to search in the internet and we were reading all the... Uh, in the internet we were searching the answer, we were reading everything but we were not able to find the answer due to lack of time. So, so it sometimes wasn't enough we time. faced that problem. Right, but, but the thing is, like, other students didn't have that problem. Oh, so what I'm saying is this: uh, is this uh, does this have, is this one of you? Is no. This, no? no. Does that look like you? Okay. What I'm saying is, if you were a teacher looking at this, what would what would be the explanation for someone getting like an A plus, an A, an A minus, a bad F, an A, a bad F, an A, uh, an A plus, and a bad F? What, like, why does the student jump up and down? one reason be like uh, since uh, we were told like four out of six right mm -hmm. so it's that we have uh, taken the other two tests as light uh, considering uh, we have good scores in the other other, other four tests so yeah. right so uh, well, okay so what you're saying is because of the of the first six tests during the semester not yeah. counting the final yeah. the best four grades count yeah so you're saying that the students did so good on the first three that they did they let the fourth one, they said, I don't care, I'm doing good. 
Uh, I mean, because they, they still have two more tests, so they could, uh, if one is gone, they could have done it be better in the next two tests. At least one they could do better in the next two tests. Okay, so you're saying on this one they're not trying so hard because they're doing good so far. Mm -hmm. And if they do bad, then they'll study hard for the next one. Yeah. Then they'll do bad on, then they'll do, then when they did good on this one, they say, I don't need this one. Yeah. So they don't study. But a lot of students did that. A lot of students. All right, so maybe that's one explanation. But, but the final count, both parts of the final count for your overall grade. And I, I don't drop part of the final. So why would the student do really well on the first part of the final and horrible on the second half? Well, all right, so, because this was on the same day. This was like, these two tests were taken within an hour of each other, right? So, uh, and they needed to score good on both. And one was like an A, a perfect score, and the other one was like practically an F. I mean, uh, you know, if, if you get half the questions right on a true or false test, it basically means you don't know anything. This was like a little bit better, 14 out of 24, a little bit better than, than no knowledge at all. This means you know like everything, and this means you know almost nothing. And it was the same topics. But anyway, so. What I ended up doing over the semester, because I have to meet a lot of conditions, I have to give a lot of test questions from semester to semester. I have to match previous semesters so I could demonstrate that the students are improving their knowledge with new techniques of teaching. And then some of the tests would be all brand new questions. So the questions on test four, test six, and final exam part two, were all questions that I've never given before, but all the other tests were repeats from previous semesters. So if a student has grades like A, 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 F, A, F, A, F, and it's pretty obvious that this is a student who has the answers to previous questions. Um, it would be statistically, so, so this is basically, uh, you know, 24 questions. Of the, the three tests, this test, this test, and this test, it would be a total of 24 times 3, 72 questions, where they're like getting everything wrong, and then there's be another, you know, 96 questions where they're getting everything almost perfectly right. So, then, you know, so that became somewhat of a problem. So, okay. So that, all right, so that's one just, we're just talking in general here. I'm not, I don't know, is any of those grades your guys' grades? Do you recognize any of those? No. I didn't have the whole class. All right. Okay. So there's also the topic of cheating during a test. So if you're cheating during a test, and again, I went over this, I kind of went over general cheating on exams lecture. So if you watch that one, I go into more details on this. But cheating during a test is... Uh, the test, you know, you don't have the answers before the test starts. You don't come in with the answers on you. You generate the answers in the middle of the test. So students can take bathroom breaks, you know, in the middle of the test, they see a question, they go to the bathroom, then they meet their friend out at the bathroom while they're telling their friend the answers there. True or false questions, you could tell your friends in the class what the answers are. One cough is true, two coughs is false. And so you're spreading the answers around the classroom in the middle of the so, so that's another thing you can do. You can cheat before the test if you have the test in advance. And then you can cheat during the test um, if uh, you're spreading word around to all the students in the middle of the test after seeing the test questions. So this is a, this is a slide from my last talk, but I just repeated it again. This is from uh, 2014. This is five or six years ago. So I gave an operating systems uh, course, a test question, and uh, you know, without going into a lot of detail, well, we're an operating systems class, so it's actually a, a give a, a reference ring that where the least recently used outperforms first in, first out. Now, you don't really have to understand the question. What was interesting about th this is three separate students giving the answer to the same, so put three pace, papers on top of each other. But what they ended up doing was they gave the same answer, everybody gave the same exact answer to the question, same exact answer. And then in the middle of the test, they realized that answer was wrong. So they crossed it off, right? So everyone crossed it off. And then they gave another answer, right? A different answer. But everyone again gave the same exact 
second answer, and that was also wrong. Just it was a different wrong answer. So um, so uh, so I put out all the um, exams on a table. These, <laughs> so I put all the exam books out on a table and just took a picture of it. And it was 28 out of uh, 32 students gave that same exact wrong answer to a question and then in the middle of the test changed that wrong answer to the same exact, a second wrong answer and they all had the same exact one. It's 28 out of 32 students did that. So, so how, what do you think that would, would explain that? No? All right. But so, I mean, it couldn't be that they just all simultaneously came up with the same wrong answer, wrote it down, and then all simultaneously came up with the same, again, wrong answer. You know, obviously the word was being spread around. In, in the, but it was done during the test. If it was done before the test, they wouldn't have gotten it wrong. They would have just got, they would have just had one answer. So somehow the word got around the class. This is the answer. And then someone said, oh, Wrong answer, told everyone the new answer, so everyone had to cross off the old one and put down the new answer. But this is the type of question where there are many, many correct answers and many, many wrong answers, and all the students should have different correct answers. It's not like there's only one correct answer. So, uh, so the question is, how can, uh, how can a, a grader detect this? So, um, so suppose, for example, um, the grader would have to notice that a subset of the students gave the same exact wrong answer. So suppose, for example, there were 32 uh, exams to be graded. And the grader grades exam one, then exam two, then exam three, and does them sequentially, one to 32. And suppose student three, 16, and 27 were sharing answers with each other in the middle of the test. So they gave the same exact wrong answers to the same questions. Could the grader notice it? Do you think the grader would notice it or not? Yeah. No? Yeah. Right. Well, it, it would be kind of rare um, because, unless it was like a really strange answer, like you look at the answer and go, why did they say that? And then Another student, whoa, that's the same crazy answer. But if it's just a wrong answer and you're going through and grading them all, you might miss it. Another thing that a lot of colleges do, and there's some professors here who do this, they have graders. Students grade their tests for them, and sometimes they'll break the pile into three tests. And grader one gets one pile, grader two gets another pile, grader three gets another pile. So if grader one saw this one, and grader two saw this one, and grader three saw this one, they would never know they matched because they didn't even see the other students' uh, exams. So um, yes, like I say, sometimes there's several graders, and they, they would not, they would never notice that. There was a case in uh, there was a case in uh, at Columbia University. It's, it's, you can Google it: you know, cheating scandal at Columbia University where there was a, one grader noticed that three different students handed in the same exact wrong answer and then started reviewing all the tests. But it's kind of, it's a lot of human error and it could be easily missed if that's the case. But uh, if you're cheating during, not before a test, if you're cheating during an online exam, um, online exam, the students are taking an exam from anywhere in the world and they can easily sit together and chat with each other and share answers if they get the same questions. They could work on the questions together and submit the same answers. So the example like this, um, the example like this where 28 students get the same exact wrong answer, it's very easy to do. If they all get into a room together and the professor's not there and they just work on the same same questions and get the same exact wrong answer, they would all submit the same wrong answer. Um, the question is, could the grader detect it? Well, the grader is a computer. So a grader is not a person. And, and it's, you would use one computer for all, all the grading. So all of the, the grader was tied and the grader missed it, or two different graders. That doesn't exist in online testing. So during an online exam, students are taking the exam from anywhere in the world. They can sit with each other, chat with each other over the phone, text message each other.
So the question is, if the questions are identical, data science software, that's a new field now, go through data to collect statistics about data, um, software can be used to compare the answers uh, for all the students, and second, looking at all the students' grades compared to, to each other. Okay. So if students have correct answers and incorrect answers, and they hand it in the same exact correct and incorrect answers, software can detect that. So now we get into, and like I said, um, I'm not going to go over heavy statistics on test grades now, but I could, uh, I'll go over that in another, in another talk. But I just want to go over some sig uh, statistical significance. So if two students are asked two true or false questions, suppose you had a true or false question test that only had two questions, question one and question two. And uh, both of them got question one correct and the other one wrong, and, uh, the first one right and the second one wrong. Can you say those two students cheated? Or, or not? <laughs> so let's say, let's say you two took a true or false test, same two questions, you got the first one right and the second one wrong, she got the first one right and the second one wrong. Can I say, oh, these two cheated? There's a 50% chance. 50% chance that was going to happen anyway. If I took two people who got one right and one wrong, there's a 50% chance it was going to happen anyway. There's only one other way you could get one right and one wrong. is You got the second one right and the first one wrong. So, so it's not enough data to make a conclusion like that. Right, there's 50% chance it just happened naturally. Well, 50% is a big percent. So, um, and like I say, you would, when you go into the heavy statistics of it, you know, that's where we could could kind of say, what, at what point do you say uh, this, the students are cheating versus it's just luck? So suppose we had an example. If two students took a 14, you might think that's a strange number, but I did this for a reason, 14 true or false questions, and they both got the same exact 11 questions right and the same exact three questions wrong, right? Right, so you had 14 questions. Two students got 11 right and three wrong, and their test match identically. Right? Can we say they cheated? And now this one needs, needs a little math, but what, would you say yes or no? Just yes. You'd say they definitely cheated? Yeah. Uh, OK. Because they got the same 11 right and the same 3 wrong. That's way too much coincidence. Yes. Right? Okay. So, um, so, that, so there's actually, like, you ever listen, you ever see people that go over like election, uh, when an election comes, they say, we surveyed, uh, you know, there's 120 million people in the United States. And they say, we surveyed 900 people and we think this candidate's going to win by four points over this one. And you're like, you only asked 900 people, you're trying to guess for one. 120 million people, why do you ask such a small number? But there's certain s sets of numbers where you say, okay, at this point we can predict with you know 95% confidence that we got it right. So actually the answer to this question is it's it's debatable. Mm -hmm. Right? So here here's a here's kind of without getting into too much statistics. Uh, so what is the probability that they have the same exact answer and they didn't cheat? Well it turns out if one student, if I had a whole bunch of students and then I pulled out all the papers of the people who got 11 right and 3 wrong, and I compared them to see if they had matching answers, what is the chance that two students would have a matching answer? Well, it would end up being, if you know statistics, the first student gets 3 wrong. Now I take the second student and say, what is the chance that one of their wrong ones exactly matches one of the three of the other ones? Well, that's 3 out of 14 that one of them will match. What's the chance that the next one will match one of the two remaining ones? That's two out of 13. And then the chance that the last one matches the only other one that the X wrong is one out of 12. So the probability of it is one out of 364 that two people would have exactly matching um, tests. So why do I like this example with 14 questions and 11 right and three wrong? Because I like this fraction. One out of 364. So There's 365 days in a year, right? Mm -hmm. So one out of 364 and one out of 365 are very close to each other. So suppose I was to ask the two of you what your birthday was 
what's the chance your birthdays would match? Right? Yeah. One out of 365. So if they both match, I can't. I wouldn't say, oh, you must be lying. You have matching birthdays. You have to be lying. No, well, it's one out of three. It could happen. Yeah. So the probability of a 14-question true or false test where two students got 11 right and three wrong and their questions matched exactly, the probability of that happening is one out of 364. It's kind of like the probability of the two students having a matching birthday. Well, there's a famous... Um, if you Google the birthday paradox, it's an interesting question. It basically says that if you had a group of people, group of people in a room, and you asked, how many people do I need in the room so that the expected number of, that there would be an expectation that there would be a pair of people whose birthdays match? You might think it's a high number, right? Like 150 or something? But it's actually a pretty low number. It turns out to be, and again, there's a lot of probability to this. I could bring up an Excel spreadsheet when you go through this. But it turns out, if you had 23 people in a room, and we had 25 people in our operating systems class, yes. right? So chances are, there was a pair of students whose birthdays matched, just naturally. Mm -hmm. So the idea is if you had 23, there's a probability of 50% there's a match. And the expected number of matches would, you know, you could have two matches, you could have zero matches but the expected number of matches would be one. Um, I think if you had 27 students, the expected number of matches would be one. So if I gave, so let's say for example, um, suppose we had a class, if there were 200 students in a class, and they were all given a 14 true or false question test, and then out of all 200 students, I pulled out all the students who got 11 right and three wrong, and I said, and let's say there were 23 of them, and then I found two of them had identical 11, the same exact 11 questions, right, and the same exact three questions wrong. I'd say, ah, I caught them cheating. But the truth of the matter is, according to the birthday paradox, it's expected there'll be one match. Yeah. So I really can't say they cheated. <laughs> It'd be like asking 23 students, what is your birthdays, and two of them match. I'd say, oh, you two must be lying. No, probably not. It probably could happen naturally. So the probability of that happening would be 50%. So I can't really say those two students who had matching tests um, cheated. But I could then give them all another 14 question test, and if those two students match again, then there's a problem, right? So, uh, so let's say statistical significance. So if 200 students were asked a 14 question test, um, and they got uh, 11 right and 3 wrong. Of 23 students who had, there was a pair that matched exactly. If I then give those two students another 14 question test, and once again they get 11 right and 3 wrong and they match exactly, that would be, you know, what's the probability of that happening? That would be the same as using the birthday paradox. Finding two students in a room who have matching birthdays and then asking those two students, What's your mother's birthday and the mother's match? Right now, that's at this point you can kind of say, all right, something's wrong, <laughs> right? So uh, you know, so when you when you indict somebody in court, you have you don't have enough inf uh, evidence that they're guilty, but you have enough evidence to go, I think something's wrong here. We need to take a look at it, and then you run a second experiment, and it happens again. Now it's now you can kind of say, statistically, these two students are cheating. If, so Right, so now I don't really have to have two 14-question tests, I could just have one big 28-question test. And uh, if they get uh, six wrong and 22 right and they match exactly, it's, you, can significant, you can say that these two students are copying off of each other. They're handing in the same test. Uh, you know, so it's kind of like this thing. This thing. <laughs> They're just handing in the same, everyone's handing in the same wrong answers. Um, okay. So, um, so let's say here's just some, some snapshots out of some Excel spreadsheets I was doing on probabilities of two students. Uh, two students take a true or false test and get the same exact incorrect, correct and incorrect answers. So if they had a 14 question test and they got 11 right and three wrong, the probability of that happening is like the birthday paradox. This is basically the probability of two people having the same birthday. Right? It's possible if you have enough students. 
You had 28 questions if you doubled it, and you got 22 right and 6 wrong. This is the probability of two people having matching birthdays, and then their mother's birthdays match, too. You had 48 questions, and uh, 40 right and 8 wrong, for example. It would be this number. Now, just as a perspective, the probability of hitting the Powerball jackpot is 3.4 times uh, 10 to the minus 9. That's the, that's the biggest jackpot in the United States. So the probability of giving two students a 48 question um, true or false test, the both students got 40 right and 8 wrong, and their answers matched exactly, it would be just almost as hard as hitting the Powerball jackpot. And if you got, if you got one more wrong, if you got 39 right and 9 wrong, that's harder to happen than hitting the Powerball jackpot. If you went as high as 72 questions, that's a big test, 72 true or false questions. If someone, even if you had two very good students, if someone got, if two students got 69 right and three wrong, but they got the same exact three wrong, the probability of that is 1.75 times 10 to the minus 5. Very, very unlikely that it would happen. And then if it went as low as 66 right and 6 wrong, the probability of that happening is much, much more rare than hitting the Powerball jackpot. So if I gave two students 72 questions, 72 true or false questions, and they got 66 right and 6 wrong, and their answers matched exactly, that would be much more rare than, much more rare than hitting the Powerball jackpot. So, yeah, so there's a lot of statistics behind deciding whether or not a student, you know, saying, looking at the data science, whether a student cheated or not. So, if one student cheats, what should we do? If, if students cheat, what should we do? So the university policy is the student gets an F in the course. The student may go before the ethics board and could be expelled from the school. Right? Okay. What do you feel about that? Is it? Actually, that's too much. I mean, expelling or something. Yeah, I, I, I kind of think so too. I, it would be nice if, if you just say, hey, look, you're yeah, caught, you're cheating. Stop, knock it off, <laughs> right? Um, and and, and uh, I don't know. So, right, so there's, there's a big debate about this. Now, what if you're in a class where 85% of the students are cheating and 85% deserve, uh, deserve an F, but their average is an F? What can, if you're the teacher, what can you do? What would be reasonable? Forget about following the rules. Well, if you follow the rules, all the students fail and could all possibly get expelled from the school. That's if you're following the rules. So what would you do <laughs> if that happened, if you were the teacher? Just don't, you know, it's not going to count towards that you're great. <laughs> What could, what, would you, what could you do in a case like that? And, and, and what you want is, you, you're not looking to give everyone an F to punish them. You want the students to say, I've got to learn. I, you have to learn. You have to stop doing this. What, what could you do? I'll not give them both A and F. I'll give them some middle grades or something. Right, right. So, so for example, one thing you could do is, would you fail 85% of the class? Well, that was actually, are you guys new to the university? This, uh, no. Like I came in August. Okay, about a year, a semester and a half ago, there was a professor mm -hmm. who failed 80, about 85 percent of the class. That's why I put this here. And the idea was, you know, those students should be expelled. Well, the only person who got expelled was the professor. <laughs> He's not here anymore. So, so as much as the university says, oh, you have to give the students an F, they're kind of saying, yeah, if, if it's one out of 25 students. You could talk to them or give them an F and report them, but if it's 85% of the class, you don't give 85% of the class an F, then those students will leave the university and tell their friends don't come to this university, and then you, then you don't have a university, so all the students who worked hard and graduated, they have a degree from a university that's closed, so that's no good. So that's not a good answer either. So it's, it's a tough dilemma when, when there's a large percentage of students um, so, uh, so if grades are like this, and you can, you know, so, okay, so, 
just just a couple of uh, how much time again. So just a couple of side things. Um, I had when I when I when I used to give paper tests, right? When I used to give paper tests, I used to give tests on paper. Uh, I would give like a, a, mid, a midterm or two midterms and a final. And on the day of the paper test, about 20% of the students would get sick. Right? Oh, I'm sick, I can't come in. You know, I have to take a makeup test. So then the friends take the test, take pictures of the test, and mail them the questions, and then a week later they get to take a makeup test. Now if the makeup test had different questions, at least they know the topics and how difficult the questions are. So there's a big advantage to becoming sick. You can take a makeup test. So, um, so there were a lot of students who were getting sick when I would give paper, paper tests. When I switched to electronic tests, um, when I switched to electronic tests, um, what I ended up doing was, like I said, instead of having big tests, like two big midterms, I'd have a bunch of little tests, little one hour or 15 minute tests, and a lot of them. And I said that your best four grades out of six count. So if you're sick one day, you get a zero when that test doesn't count. You don't get a makeup. There's no makeup test. So I give six tests and I only count your best four. So you can get sick a couple of times and you'll still get a, still could easily get an A in the course. So, um, so nobody got sick anymore when I started giving electronic tests and I said, you get six tests and you have to pick your best four. So that stopped everyone from getting sick. But, um, then students would have an internet connection problems and that kind of thing that have to take, want to take a makeup test for that. So I didn't give a makeup test for that. And they knew they would get the best four out of six tests that if they missed one for any reason, you're on an airplane, or the internet went down, whatever the reason is, that test just doesn't count. There's no makeup test. But the final exam is where uh, nothing gets dropped. So some, uh, two of the students, I did this in four different classes, two of the students noticed that the first final exam uh, had questions that were in the past and they had the answers to them, right? So they did very well on the test. And then the second test, they started the second test and they realized they don't have the answers. So two of the students sent me an email the next day saying the internet went down. After the first test was finished, and right at the beginning of the second test. Another student, uh, I don't have his grade here, another student um, got 100 on the first final, the one where he had all the answers to the questions, and on the second one he didn't answer any questions. And then the next day he sent me an email saying, uh, was there a part two of the final? I thought I only did the first part, I didn't know there was a second part. But the way the website works is as soon as you hit the button to start the test, it fills out a test book for you with all your questions, and then you can go through your questions and answer them. So in order, if he never knew about the test, there wouldn't be a test book for him. So when the test started, he hit the button to start the test, which means he can see the questions. But then the next day he sent me an email saying, I didn't know there was a second test. But he logged in and hit the button and started the test. And then the next day said, I don't have the test. So, so, uh, so you know, it gets kind of frustrating to, uh, to put a lot of work into creating a website like this. And then, uh, and then the students just try to figure out what's the best way to achieve it. So, so I kind of like your answer. I'm not going to say what your name is, right? So, but, um, I kind of like your answer. I don't believe in failing all the students uh, who cheat, but the students who don't cheat should get their honest grades. And the students who do cheat, like, so now the thing is this, I could kind of say this grade, this grade, this grade, this grade, and this grade don't count because the student's just sitting there with the answers and he's just checking off the answers, right? So this doesn't show anything. And if I took this grade, this grade, and this grade and average them together, the student would get an F. So, um, so the question then is, uh, what can I do? So, so basically, what I decided to do was to give all the students who didn't cheat grades that were in the you know A, A minus, B plus area, and then all the students who did cheat would be at a certain level in those grades on down, 
And then I tried to use the grades where they didn't have the answers to get an idea of who's a good student and who's not a good student. But the idea of failing the whole class, failing 80% of the class isn't uh, a good idea. I think what I'd rather is just students realize these tests are very easy. I, th I think the tests are very easy. And uh, just study a little bit and you'll do very well in the class. I mean, so with this particular class, because so many students were cheating, it was like a student who deserved, you know, a student who wasn't cheating deserved like a C plus, ended up getting an A minus because I didn't, I had to push all the non-cheating students' grades up to the top to push the cheating students under them. And it just really threw up all the grades. So, uh, so I know I gave a lot of tests, right? Do you ever have a teacher who gives eight tests in a semester? No. Okay. So, uh, but one of the reasons I do this is, is because, uh, because this used to happen. And if I give one midterm and everybody hands in the same exact wrong answers, that the entire midterm is worthless. It doesn't tell me anything. Everyone handed, everyone handed in the same exact answers. And I have no indication of who knows what. So, so, um, so, if, so what I have to do to satisfy the university and our accreditation board, I have to give some tests that have the same exact questions from semester to semester. To figure out who's cheating and who's not cheating, I have to give additional tests with all brand new questions. And uh, it, be, you know, it becomes very painful <laughs> uh, to do. And, and it's pretty, I don't know. Uh, so I, I, what I'm hoping students can do is just realize um, it's better to learn the material. Right? You're going to graduate and look for a job. They don't care, the companies you hire, I went over this in the, in the first video too, the companies don't care uh, how good your grades are. They, they're going to test you when you come in for the interview. And if you don't know anything, they're not going to hire you. So, yeah. so it's important to learn. Uh, 